Let's talk scrubs and political correctness. Running from 2001 to 2010 and centered around the staff of the fictional Sacred Heart Teaching Hospital, Scrubs was a part of a new era of singer camera sitcom characterized by moment to moment slapstick and multiple surreal cutaway gags, ostensibly in the main character's imagination. The show follows protagonist John Dorian, played by Zach Braff, through his nine years at Sacred Heart, starting as an intern and ending as an attending physician. We also follow JD's roommate Turk, a brash, confident surgeon, JD's love interest, the neurotic and intelligent Elliot, the crushingly masculine Dr. Cox and Turk's wife, and opinionated head nurse, Carla. Through the lens of these characters, we're able to see a fully realised hospital, albeit comically bent, with all the hilarity and bittersweetness that this entails. The show received critical acclaim throughout its run with one misstep receiving 17 Emmy nominations, winning the Humanitas Prize three times, a Peabody Award, and Braff himself was nominated for three Golden Globes. It's fair to say that the show was fairly well received during its initial run. I personally have a deep love for the show and credit it with getting me through quite a few tough situations in my life. I find the blend of heartfelt writing, over-the-top performances and excellent music choices to be what keeps me coming back to the show. And with its addition to various streaming services, countless other people do too. Sadly, that doesn't mean everything on the show has aged well. Braff and Donald Faison, who plays Turk, have been releasing a weekly podcast, Fake Friends, Real Doctors, as they watch every episode chronologically and sharing stories from the filming period. In an interview for BBC Newsbeat, Braff came straight out and said, some of it is way too un-PC. I'm sure for now, we often cringe and go, okay, you definitely couldn't do that joke today. And he isn't wrong. JD and Turk's non-traditionally masculine friendship is occasionally coded as gay and played for laughs. Guy love, that's all it is. Carla is often portrayed as overly emotional, naggy, something her husband has to escape from. Dr. Kelso and the Todd are very blatant examples of workplace harassment. And Dr. Cox is so overtly toxic to nearly every character he meets. Now, what I'm not saying is that we need to cancel Scrubs. I'm in no place to tell you whether the show is offensive or not. I can only say that looking back, Dr. Cox referring to JD by girls' names in an attempt to belittle him is probably toxic behavior that we shouldn't find funny. Please don't overlook my major argument within the piece because I call Dr. Cox toxic. I understand the character's major arc is coming to terms with his friendship and admiration for JD, but his abusive behaviour is often played for laughs, which enforces the idea that abuse in the workplace makes you work harder and doesn't just make you miserable. Now, this leads me to my main point of the video. Has political correctness gone mad? 80% of Americans think so. Even the youths. The edgy, meme-ridden youths. Obviously, if a vast majority of people think something is a problem, it must be, right? You can probably tell where I'm going with this. The answer is wrong. But first, what is political correctness? The end of Western civilization. The end of the Aussie larrikin. Being nice to people you don't know. In an article for The Conversation, Clive Hamilton, Professor of Public Ethics at CAPPE, Charles Sturt University, puts it simply. To be politically correct is to choose words, and sometimes actions, that avoid disparaging, insulting, or offending people because they belong to oppressed groups. That oppression can be based on race, gender, ethnicity, sexual orientation, physical disability, etc. He then goes on to describe the emergence of the term as destructive for our discourse, borrowed from English translations of Chinese communist texts surrounding the Cultural Revolution. The phrase, that's politically incorrect, was used to confront deep-rooted prejudices and societal discrimination at an individual verbal level. Common expressions, nicknames and jokes have the ability to enforce prejudicial behaviour against oppressed groups. That shouldn't be a controversial statement, but if you think I'm wrong, think of it this way. Imagine someone at work gives you a new nickname, but you really hate it. So much so that it makes you uncomfortable. You go home and then you come back the next day and suddenly everyone's calling you that nickname. The trays across the street, the cat called you with that nickname, the barista down the road writes that nickname on your coffee cup and hands it to you and suddenly you don't feel safe where you work, on your way to work, at your local coffee shop. Everyone in your circle is calling you something that makes you feel bad and if you say, hey, 
Could you not call me that? They just tell you, come on mate, it's just a joke. That's not even close to what it's like to have racist, sexist, homophobic, ableist slurs thrown at you, but at least I hope it'll make you think twice about talking shit about someone. Sadly, not every act of political incorrectness is as unsubtle as throwing a slur at someone in the street. Tell someone not to swear because there are women around. To you, it seems polite, but uh, to many women, that could seem infantilizing. When you watch Get Out, you feel uncomfortable when the father says, because that's politically incorrect. You're taking away someone's individual right to expression and lumping them in with a group because you think they belong in that group because of their features. In the film's case, it's his skin colour. The term microaggression gets a bad rap, mostly because of conservative, willful misinterpretation, but they often come up from well-meaning white people doing something that they perceive to be helpful, but is really just informed by their current biases. Back to the history. The real backlash against PC culture begins when conservative commentators themselves begin to push back against the left for what they perceive as imposing their will on other people, when in reality, the discourse of the time was starting to hear from just previously unheard voices. University campuses were updating curricula to feature queer, feminist, anti-colonial histories, and suddenly the loudest voices, white guys, were having to shout a lot louder to be heard over the changing tide. Hamilton describes right-wing shock jocks in the US, Rush Limbaugh and his ilk, and the Daily Mail in the UK leading the charge, running made-up stories of PC culture run amok. But the campaign against political correctness does not just lie with the right. Moira Weigel, writing for The Guardian, recounts a 1990 article published by Richard Bernstein in the New York Times, entitled The Rising Hegemony of the Politically Correct. An idea Bernstein had formed watching student activists at UC Berkeley form amongst themselves a cluster of opinions about race, ecology, feminism, culture and foreign policy that defines a kind of correct attitude towards the problems of the world. Newsweek ran a cover story entitled Thought Police. There's a politically correct way to talk about race, sex and ideas. Is this the new enlightenment or the new McCarthyism? New York Magazine referred to the politically correct students as the new fascists. In a quote from Weigel's article, if you search ProQuest, a digital database of all US magazines and newspapers, you find the phrase politically correct rarely appeared before 1990. That year, it turned up over 700 times. In 1991, there's more than 2,500 instances. In 1992, it appeared more than 2,800 times. Beagle's most damning quote, however, is in her analysis, where she states, PC was a useful invention for the Republican right because it helped the movement to drive a wedge between working class people and the Democrats who claimed to speak for them. Political correctness became a term used to drum up the public imagination, the idea that there was a deep divide between ordinary people and the liberal elite who sought to control the speech and thoughts of regular folk. Opposition to political correctness also became a way to rebrand racism in ways that were politically acceptable in the post-civil rights era. That brings us to now. In the 2010s and today, in 2020, it's a fairly common thing to hear from a certain group of people that PC culture is ruining everything. Or the classic, well, well you couldn't make that today. <laughs> Oftentimes talking about some kind of trailblazing satire that mocks the exact kind of thinking that is now defending it. <laughs> the issue with believing that political correctness is destroying our culture is that the belief is just plain untrue. Writer Jonathan Crait published an anti-PC think piece in New York Magazine, How Original, in 2015, and suddenly positioned himself as the defender of the liberal centre, protecting free speech and the right to make jokes. Crait claimed that leftists were perverting idealism, and in one blunt quote, said that angry mobs are out to crush opposing ideas. And he was right. Bet you weren't expecting that particular answer. I mean, of course he was right. The year after Chait published his article to such explosive acclaim, one man ran a presidential campaign, overtly racist, sexist, and homophobic, and he won. <laughs>
I don't know how many times those of us on the left will have to say this, but liberals, and by that I mean small l liberals, not the Australian political party, the liberals, we have a common enemy. We both hate right-wing demagogues. Please help us defeat them. <laughs> Instead of kowtowing to them and their own prejudicial agenda. Political correctness as a force from the left certainly exists. We currently live in a time when protesters are tearing down statues of slave owners and racists, which you could definitely call a force of politically correct will. But when you see an article from the BBC taking down faulty towers because of political correctness or an episode of Community, really think about who asked for this. Because it, it wasn't the protesters. Getting John Cleese comedies from the 70s banned was not high on the demands list, I can guarantee you. Don't let right-wing shock jocks and grifters and crisis actors demonise progressive thought because they can't say slurs anymore. Is the Aussie larrikin dead? No, of course not. Great comedy about masculine interests still exists and has existed for decades and it will continue to be made. Just because you can't make jokes with bigoted beliefs in them anymore about people's race, sex and gender doesn't mean you're not allowed to be funny. It means you have to try harder. Being politically correct is about being inclusive, being kind, being welcoming to others and their beliefs. You shouldn't feel bad because once upon a time you made a joke in bad taste. As long as you can look back and say, hey, that was in bad taste. I might have hurt someone, and I'm gonna try to be better. Everyone can be better, mostly. Now, where does that leave Scrubs? And I'm sorry to any long-time Scrubs fans who've clicked on this video thinking they're gonna get a, a happy-go-lucky look back at their favorite TV show and have instead gotten a long diatribe about how the right-wing co-ops left-wing ideas to demonize those exact beliefs. Now, like friends before it, I suspect Scrubs will undergo a cultural shift in our minds in a few years. People have long been going back to friends uh, and finding that some of the aspects of the show can be a little bit less palatable than others. Jack Saint has an excellent video about it, which you should watch because it goes into a lot of the ideas about how we can go back to these kinds of shows and still find enjoyment in them. But personally, I don't think Scrubs is as bad. It's certainly less white. JD, while occasionally the typical nice guy, is certainly occasionally a good role model for non-traditionally masculine men. And its skewering of the American medical system is second to none on television. So when you inevitably see think pieces about how Scrubs couldn't be made today, <laughs> because society is just too darn sensitive, you'll know why that line of thinking just doesn't ring true.